Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation. Thank you for joining us for today's program, which is part of the IFPDA's Print Month and a two-part series from IPCNY, Pattern and Print. Today, we have the great pleasure of joining artist Polly Applebaum and master printer Jean-Paul Russell at Durham Press in a conversation moderated by MoMA curator of prints and drawings, Star Figura, who will be introduced properly by my friend, Judy Hecker. Judy's been the executive director of the International Print Center of New York since her appointment in 2006. Prior to that, she was an assistant curator of prints and drawings at the Museum of Modern Art. Thank you, Judy and IPCNY for bringing us this series and thank you, Star and Polly. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. We have more than 300 people registered today and we'll get to as many as possible. If you need to leave early, the program's being recorded and will be available on the website of the IFPDA next week along with the rest of Print Month. And with that, I turn the program over to Judy. Thank you. Great, thank you all for coming today and thank you to the IFPDA for teaming up with IPCNY on this two-part series today and next Friday at noon, Breaking Ground, Pattern and Print, which explores the printmaking of both Polly and next week of Joyce Kozlov, whose works are currently on view at IPCNY in our anniversary exhibition, Present Tense. And in the next image, you can see Polly's fabulous early digital print on crushed velvet, uh, lower left below a Via Selman's uh, print and next to a Julie um, Moretu print. There it is. The other impulse behind this two-part series with Polly and Joyce is the exhibition now on view at the Hessel Museum at Bard Upstate, which explores the pattern and decoration movement from the 70s to the early 80s, a part of American post-war art history that has long been overlooked, but no more. Joyce Kovloff, Kozloff features importantly into that show and Polly in many ways can be seen as a legacy and extender of that movement. And so on to our panelists today. Artist Polly Applebaum works across mediums, large scale installations of textiles, ceramics, drawings, and of course, printmaking is a particular core of her practice. Educated at SUNY Purchase and Tyler School of Art, Applebaum started exhibiting in the mid 1980s and, and has gone on to exhibit at major museums internationally and nationally, as well as at regional museums and shows with the most curious inviting titles like Second Fat Emotion, Frequently the Woods Are Pink, Waiting for UFOs, and more. Her work is currently a part of the show Ab Standard, Fiber and Abstraction in Contemporary Art at the Everson Museum in Syracuse, and this February at Arcadia University in Pennsylvania, uh, where she has been in residence for some time, she'll open a focused, multifaceted exhibition of her work. Applebaum's work is in dozens of renowned public museum collections, from the Whitney and MoMA to LACMA and the Hammer, and in many university museum collections like Yale, Princeton, Bowdoin, RISD, and so many more. Her work is framed by political contexts as she explores the boundaries between art and craft, especially the craft of printmaking. She's collaborated with Durham Press for so long and we look forward to hearing more about that. Jean-Paul Russell is master printer, founder and co-owner with Anne Marshall of Durham Press, founded in 1988 and located in beautiful Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where today they have a gallery and multiple studios. Jean-Paul learned his craft working with Rupert Jason Smith in New York City, making Warhol paintings and prints and so much more. Jean-Paul is also a fine woodworker, carpenter, welder, designer. All of this enables Durham Press to facilitate ambitious and complex projects that they make with artists, including Polly, Chitra Ganesh, Irvin Anderson, Jacob Hashimoto, Beatrice Milhazes, Mikaline Thomas, and so many more. And a special thanks to Star, Star Figura for moderating today's panel uh, and adding her voice to this important discussion. Star is a curator in the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Museum of Modern Art, where she has organized many exhibitions highlighting the significance of printmaking in the history of modern and contemporary art. These include Gauguin, Metamorphoses, German Expressionism, The Graphic Impulse, and Lucian Freud, The Painter's Etching, and so many more shows. She's also critically part of a team that has reinstalled MoMA's expanded, reimagined, 
and Cross Media Permanent Collection Galleries in 2019, and she's inextricably involved in the ongoing program of their frequent reinstallations today. So welcome to all three of you. I'm going to pass the baton over to um, Star, and we hope you'll tune in uh, next week for part two. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. And uh, thank you, Jenny, for those very nice introductions. And um, thank you as well to all of your teams, including Sherry Young of the IFPDA and Emma Wang at IPCNY for making today's event possible. I also want to thank Polly Applebaum and John Paul, Paul Russell for taking the time to be with all of us today. This is really a very special treat. And we're grateful as well to all the team at Durham Press, including Ann Marshall, Lola Wegman, and many others. And of course, we wanna thank all of you for tuning in today to join us for this conversation. This afternoon, as you know, we have the privilege of hearing from Polly Applebaum, who's one of the great artists and printmakers of our time, and from John Paul Russell co-founder and master printer at one of the great print workshops of our time, Durham Press in Durham, Pennsylvania. Polly and JP are together right now at Durham Press and they've put together a gorgeous uh, slideshow, uh, kind of an overview of their 20 year history, almost 20 year history of making prints together. But before we get to that, um, Polly, I would like to ask you very briefly, uh, welcome. And um, would you tell us, if I can, here we are, uh, would you just tell us a little bit about this print um, that's in the IPC and Y show right now? The show's up through December 18th. I encourage everybody to see it if you can in Chelsea. Um, but Polly, this was one of your first prints. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about it? Yes, well, the interesting thing is it, it was done on the computer which is kind of the antithesis of what I do with at Durham Press. Also, it's the only print that was ever published, printed on crushed stretch velvet, a synthetic velvet, which I was using in my large scale um, installations. So it was interesting that I really didn't have anything to do with the process, it was done on the computer. And this was early computer, people who know computer technology. So. Um, that for me was kind of two things that I, I really, interestingly enough, didn't carry on, but it was a great start. And so it's, it's like, I didn't even know I had one. And, um, so when Judy asked me to look and see, and I found it and it was like seeing an old friend. So, um, I think it has a lot of the kind of qualities the idea of light there's and kind of reflection that a lot of that I was getting in the um, large scale installations. And that's where the shapes came from, the dyed, um, individual dyed pieces. Right, thank you. Um, and uh, we're gonna move now to Durham Press where you both are. And I'd like to ask John Paul, if you could introduce us briefly to um, your workshop and your press and the work that you do there. Yeah, um, so this is Durham Press, which is, as you know, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, in, in an old schoolhouse built in about 1880s with an addition in the back there from the 1920s. Um, I got it in 1988. I had previously, as in the, in the introduction, worked for Rupert Smith, working for Andy and um, a bunch of other artists in New York and also became aware of the publishing process as well through Ken Tyler and Gemini and ULA. And so I sort of set out with that model in mind. Um, I started off contract printing, but with this vision to publish, which was sort of a long, arduous, uh, arduous process. Um, and I just slowly, you know, dabbled in, in all sorts of mediums and working with different artists and building up the shop um, to the point where later when my wife came in, uh, Ann Marshall, and helped on the publishing side, which was, is as anybody knows, a huge part of 
what this business is. There's the making, but there's also the representation, and um, especially for a publisher. Um, and that's that's sort of it. Um, it's a big 8,000 square foot building, and um, over the years, there's been single presses and then another room and another studio and then big metal workshop in the basement with woodworking equipment. So it's been a, just a slow build of, of a business and a process and a working relationships with artists. Thank you. And, and I think we'll, we'll have a chance to get a, a little more sense of that when we go through the slides. Um, so let's go ahead and, and get to that. Um, it, it is uh, obviously such a special place. And as Judy um, mentioned, there are, sorry, I'm trying to advance. There we go. Um, there, there are so many artists, I think, who have returned um, repeatedly to make prints with you because it's, it's a special place and they want to come back, but probably none more than, than Polly, uh, who has been pretty regularly. I mean, if you can see um, the projects on the Durham Press website, um, you know, every year, every couple of years, uh, Polly seems to be spending time at Durham Press making prints ever since 2002. So um, Polly, would you tell us how you got started um, at Durham? Well, I was introduced to Durham through um, another artist, Beatrice Moyazes. And I went, came out and I think I met JP and Anne. And it wasn't the first thing on my mind. I had studied printmaking, but it had been 30, 20, 25 years since I had made prints. And so um, we slowly had a conversation and Anne's father um, was a book dealer. And so a good place to start, and, and JP will have to come in too, was, um, was we went through Anne's father's books and we came across this wonderful book on color exercises. And so that was a good place to start because I think it's a long-term relationship. You've got to start somewhere. And, I was at this point, give context to where I was in my life, I was working on a, a mid-career survey at ICA in Philadelphia. So um, this is where we started. Yeah, I mean, I, I just reminded Polly earlier that, that right before uh, kind of latching on to this idea and this project of this book, what we actually did experiment with printing on felt um, a little bit like the Musex print, but um, just experimenting because that's the way Polly was working. And it just seemed like we were chasing something that was just maybe making what she was already making in the studio. And then we looked at the book and the color exercises. And so the book became this thing that we illuminated, that Polly illuminated and kind of, we finished certain exercises that were incomplete in the book. and. Um, went on to just make this sort of group of prints, um, which really was just an introduction, a way to get, as Polly said, a way to get started, which, which seems crazy. But one thing that I realized during the process was that Polly was the kind of an artist that didn't really want to make traditional prints in the sense of the process of working where you make a step, you shoot a screen or burn a plate, and then you set it up and you register it, you pick a color and you print. It's kind of as any printmaker would know, or even artists know, um, it can be boring, it can be very process oriented. And so when we moved on to the next project, um, which is new work that she was already making of the flowers, um, we started to play a little bit more with that idea. Um, I'll just, I think can you I... always, whoops, maybe go to the next slide. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say for, for people who don't know this, this book um, by Eugène Chevray, who is a French um, chemist and one of the scientists in the 19th century who um, basically um, pioneered the discovery of these sort of laws of optics and, and color. And I think with this book, the idea is, uh, or his, his, what he put forward was the fact that when you look at any one, the way you perceive any one color is necessarily affected by um, the colors that are adjacent to it. And I think that is something that uh, we see in your work, right, Polly? Like mm -hmm. everything. Yes. So well, let's go to the next one. Oops. I don't know why it's not advancing. There we go. 
Um, so these are some of your first prints, correct? Could you tell us a little bit about them? Well, this was the first um, we completed. Why, why I wanted you to see it all, this was the whole um, series. And what you were saying, and what was interesting, we were experimenting with the spray. So when my, my favorite of the bunch is the little dots. And if you can look that you see, if you look at color, you see another color. And so that kind of relationship. So we were, we were it's kind of like a fake. JP, we, we were spraying the color like the opposite hue. And I just love the kind of trick of, of that kind of color exercise. So we were making the color exercises. And so um, it, it's funny for me to see these. I like them, but I'm sort of, I think they were about JP and I getting comfortable with each other and trying to find a, a, a working relationship. Yeah, exactly. So I'm kind of removed from them, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, some of these come directly from the book as they sit on the page. The big uh, vertical print on the right is actually seven pages put together where he goes through an entire exercise page after page. And we thought, why not put the whole thing on one, one print. So it's quite a large print, it's like 80 inches high and 30 inches wide, um, but in the same scale. And the print that Polly loves in the lower left there, which does have these sort of complementary glows was two pages of four dots. And I couldn't figure out why he had done just two pages because something was missing. And so we actually put four more dots which completed this exercise. So you have a a warm color of each and the cool color of each. You have the warm red and the bluish red, then have both different complements to go with it, which is slightly um, different hues of the transparent color. So it's actually a 24 color print, even though it seems quite simple. Oh, wow. And these are all screen prints, correct? These are all made, screen prints. Made in 2002. Yeah. And, and that then... was interesting for me too, because I had studied, um, Silk screen, and I really love silk screen, but it was interesting. It was, you know, so I think we really had to kind of go through this process. And I knew that JP was a master silk screen printer, but it's interesting that um, that's not what we <laughs> really concentrated on. So that's why I think it's this was a good exercise color wise and otherwise. <laughs> it also set kind of, the, the color chart bug, as you can even see behind us from an early stamp, from an early point, just these color charts and using that in the work. And so it kind of has a structure and, and I was always interested in color charts. I made color charts for the large scale installations too. So it wasn't something very far off. And I think that's what really attracted us um, to that book and using it as a structure for future work and for these prints. Right, so it's a getting to know each other and kind of laying the groundwork for what's to come, which should I go to the next one on mm -hmm. that note? Yeah. Oh, here, okay. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at pieces of mine from the 80s. Um, I mentioned that I was having a survey show at ICA in Philadelphia. And so two pieces that use flowers um, were the wall flowers on the left made out of a million different flowers tacked to the wall. And these little cut out a piece called um, flower patch. And they were made by a um, pattern maker. So, the flower was in the studio, maybe go to the, um, in the history of my work. I love that the flowers um, were, I had sort of removed, gone a more abstract way. And then at a certain point, gone back to the flowers um, and started drawing flowers. I was really interested, everybody doodles. And I was also interested in um, kind of, reinventing the form, how many different flowers I could make. So I was drawing on the velvet, but I was also um, had a experience with the large scale, the 2020 uh, Polaroid camera up at Mass College of Art, where I was working 
with the large scale Polaroid, but also um, cutting out these flowers in the studio and making large scale installations. There was one in New York called uh, Cartoon Garden. So the flower was came back um, with vengeance and maybe we can, um, so it was interesting when we finished that one series, I kind of was looking at um, what was going on in the studio and what I was interested in in making prints of. So, so just to be clear for our viewers, these are these are not prints. These are um, examples of your unique work, unique work in with fabric. Um, yeah. In, in in the early is it the early nineties here? These are early nineties. Yeah. And, um, the Polaroid camera was one to one. I would make uh, the velvet, I would draw with stain the velvet flowers, cut them out, take them up to Mass College of Art, put them on a board, <laughs> and we photographed them. So the installation, these were called Funky Flowers and no, Funky Specials. That series, the series of Polaroids were Funky Specials. And it was a real treat to work with the the big um, Polaroid cameras, which aren't, I don't think they're around anymore. And, but it was this back and forth of what was going on and, and kind of drawing. I remember the first, um, I took some of these to the studio for um, JP to see the, what, the image on the left um, on velvet. And at first, I think I, I wanted him to draw the flowers. <laughs> You know, here I am. It was funny. I just, I, I had to get comfortable with with printmaking again, and and also um, find my my way in the studio, the printmaking studio. And so the next slide, called "Just Flowers," was our first um, print with the woodblock. Yeah. I mean, we made a series of three prints, uh, this woodblock print, um, a stenciled and silk screened print, um, the stencil being the kind of stain that Polly was using. So instead of trying to kind of make plates of the stain spray marks, we actually just used a light little light plywood and cut out holes and sprayed uh, dye through it to create the, the diffused look on the flowers. And then there was an etching. And what occurred to me on these prints and having gone through the experience of the first seven prints and that sort of more traditional print process was that with the woodblock, if I just made a hundred flowers and Polly could just come and then loosely rearrange them and make mono prints, that that would be a really, could potentially be a really great fit for a way to work with her in which she was able to engage more and not be standing on the sidelines waiting for each process to happen. And so Polly drew, I think we just took some cheap interleaf paper and she took a, a pencil and drew a bunch of different things. And then we mounted it to plywood and cut out a, a hundred flowers. And um, that really became the, the beginning of, mm -hmm. of us working together in a way. And what I really loved about it is that having worked with Rupert, doing Andy's work and making paintings, Printmaking was always sort of, it was in there because we also made the, the prints and and, pub, and ran editions and did all that traditional printmaking. But with the paintings, the, the silk screen was just a tool. Could it could have been painted, it could have been printed, it could have been stamped on. And I always wanted to bring that aspect to Durham Press. And I think with Polly's work together was one of the ways in which we really utilized both, both things, her wanting to work in this really original way. and very free and loose and also making original art, you know, through this, through printing, although it wasn't the primary, you know, driver. Could I, could I ask you, Polly, to say a little bit about flowers, what the significance of flowers in your work? As you mentioned, JP, you mentioned uh, Warhol, who of course did some famous um, paintings and prints of, of flowers. Um, and I, I believe your work, Polly, is sometimes compared to that. And, um, just, um, just for our viewers, you know, could you speak a little bit about, about flowers for you? Well, I think it's interesting because of the, um, the place flowers hold in the decorative, but also in the emotional and that kind of 
place for me. People use flowers for memorializing. People use flowers, if you can, the one image that I love from the 60s of the love child putting the flower in the gun, how political it is too. And so for me, the ubiquitousness, I can't the word, but that it's, they're everywhere and they're accessible and it, it brings people in. It's interesting, I have a friend who I collaborated with on a mural in Philadelphia and she, she has leukemia and you're not allowed to bring flowers into a hospital because that there's a lot of reasons, but it was, it was so meaningful for me that how people react and it was interesting we went into this you know it's it, there are, there's lows there's high if you look at the decorative you look at some of the history of, of flower painting and women there's really interesting how it has been taken seriously it hasn't been taken seriously how it, it can just sort of what i like is we went into this we had no idea, it just kind of, it was something in my work and the flowers have come and that's why it was interesting for me to show the, the wallflower piece probably was the first one. Then, then I was working with Andy Warhol's dingbat, his flowers. Um, there's earlier examples of that too. So for me, it's the gift that keeps giving. It, it's, there's, it's, it, ha, it operates on so many different levels and that's what I was really interested in. Thank you. Um, do you wanna say anything more about this slide or should we keep going? Let's keep going. Okay, so it's getting, it's getting bigger here. Well, the thing is, what I have to say with that's JP. <laughs> no, that's not. That's Jason. <laughs> no, that's not Jason. Oh, that's not I'm Jason. Sorry. I'm sorry. I got you. <laughs> but JP likes big, which is nice. I like big too. You know, I work big in installation, and we found this paper. You can say a little bit about the yeah the paper. We, I think, one of the people that worked at Durham Press had suggested this heavy-duty paper, this handmade Japanese paper with this Kozo fiber, which was, which is incredibly absorbent paper. Um, it really takes ink like almost like no other paper that at least I've experienced um, when it comes to making wood blocks with this saturated color. But what you see basically on the left was the jump from the last slide of the little print and making, I think it was about 24 flowers to increasing that to 100 or 200 flowers. Um, I just thought we needed to start in a place where we had enough you know, objects to work with, where we could keep the flow of it going, where we could work on one print and also while inking up blocks for another. So um, the slide on the left is a print that's about four feet square. And, um, but it didn't take long to get to the one on the right, which is about uh, 80 by 80 inches, which is just short of seven feet, um, where we even added more flowers, even larger flowers, more small ones. What I love is the table of color. And, and that's sort of what, if you go back to basics, the paper, the ink, and also the method. And what is interesting here in this photo, you can see one turn, but it takes a very stable hand. I lay out the table, somebody, the inkers are inking. And at that point there was probably one inker, that's Jason. And then I put it um, on, the, on the paper, but right side up, J, um, Jason has to turn all those flowers. So it's a real puzzle. So that, the kind of labor and the intensity of that from inking to, as I was talking with you earlier, making an installation. So there's a lot of um, steps that go, that we took to get to this, um, meaning the paper, the ink, all of that, and, and laying out the table. Usually we have, we can have a hundred, um, I think on the next slide, you can see um, we can have um, 
hundreds of colors. There you can see the blocks too, and you can also see the hydraulic press. Yeah. It's phenomenal. So um, just, this is what, around 20, when, it, when did you make these? Like 2012? Oh uh, no, it's much, it's much earlier. I think it's more like um, 2005 or six is when- Oh, these... so it's very soon after the small print and you jump to the, to the big- Yeah, and... it, it was when we worked with a four foot square format for a little bit and then um, we just slowly kept building. Every time Polly came back, we would increase the, we, she would draw flowers before she would leave and then we would cut more. So we'd increase, always add like another hundred blocks. Um, to really just keep the scale and the complexity going, especially to be able to, you know, be inking, but also while printing. So we had to have enough for at least two or three prints going at the same time. Um, and just the diversity, just to be able to um, make make the work. And what what's interesting is that from the sprayed kind of more complex or the dyed things that Polly was doing, um, we we just abandoned that, that thing for this more basic, kind of quality of printing, but with huge complexity with the amount of colors and the amount of blocks. That's what we kind of replaced it with and working with a more straightforward mm -hmm. language just it is what it is. And it's, um, and the, this, the title too, these are called love parks and Pennsylvania, there's um, a park downtown in Philadelphia called love park. So um, the biggest prints we have um, are the Love Park series. And the scale is, was just so wonderful. And, and I like the one-shot deal. These are one-shot deals. They would go into, um, at first we could pile on as many as we could. And um, Jason, and here you can see maybe, I think he was reprinting, but usually very rarely did we have to put the um, block into the blocks the whole table back into the um, into the hydraulic press. Did you have the whole the press all along? I forgot. Yeah, yeah, I had it. I got it in the early nineties. So. Mm -hmm. And that's the the hydraulic press is the green uh, big press at the left. Yeah, yeah, which a hydraulic the... press in case it's like a incredible pressure. It just comes straight down and applies incredible pressure. Um, right, like to the, from mm -hmm. onto the block to transfer to the paper. So yeah. it's not like an etching press or a litho press where it rolls through. It just the pressure just comes straight down. Um, that press was really important to the process. We had one room where we would do the color, then we'd bring everything in here. I didn't. Um, I would place the blocks on the table, on the print, on the paper. Jason would flip them then it would go into the hydraulic press. And these are each, each one is a mono print. So each one is unique, but you're re, recombining um, the wood blocks from one to the next, is that correct? Yeah, but there's, yeah. there's so many blocks that generally they right. would never- It's not always, this, it's not the same blocks. It's a different, some, some come, some go. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, it's phenomenal. Well, it's, How, how many mono prints altogether did you make in this group? Um, that's hard to say. I mean, in the park size, I believe there's something like 25 over many years. I think it was close mm. to 10 years or something. Um, oh, so you, you kept making these for many years? They kind of kept getting made and then the blocks kept changing and then the complexity and the layout. Um, some of them have thousands of blocks in them where you're just filling an entire sheet with small blocks. So they were really, really intense to make. And also this, the scale of these, you know, it's, it's one thing to do flowers and talk about flowers in, in any way that you like. And when we started off, even at four feet, we were making some really big, beautiful prints and you could say what you wanted. But I think when we got to this size, we knew there was just something else going on here. Um, they were profound in a whole, for a whole different reason that had nothing to do with flowers. And I think that really was why we worked so hard and kept going with this size and became like a staple, really, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Polly, you talked about, you talked about, you mentioned installation and how um, this, 
the way you're working with prints with JP, it becomes a sort of a, almost like an installation process because install, you know, so much of your work is installation based, right? Well, it's also too thinking about if you, what I like about this slide is you see it on the floor, almost the horizontal, and then you see it on the wall. And in the large scale installation, I'm very comfortable with the horizontal. So I think we tapped into something there. Yeah. The way I make these, there is a correlation to the way I make large scale installations. So bending over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which you would keep. Lot, and a oh, lot sorry. of different elements, if you can see. But yeah, um, it really was a zone that I am very comfortable with. Once we started, I sort of knew that space. And I think we had a rhythm and um, developed a way of working that was a really interesting for me. It was, it, it just, I, it's, 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 it became the studio. It, it, it was a studio, but it was, there was no difference between the studio space of my studio on Water Street to the studio space at Durham. And that's really special it, and, it, and it took a long time, but it was all the same. You know, there was, you know, it, it was very fluid. Uh, oh, there's a question already from, from Martin Nash. Um, in the slide with the hydraulic press, the individual blocks and the, uh, I'm in the large print, the blocks are so much smaller than the flowers in the printed work. How does the enlargement take place? Um, can you explain that? I, I think- Well, I there, just in this particular photo, there, there, there's no big blocks in the room, but they're, um, they're in the other room. All the blocks are one-to-one. -one, so if, if you're looking at that print on the table there, that big blue, green and black and yellow block, I think they're around 30 inches um, in, in diameter, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're just cut out of huge sheets of out of huge sheets of plywood. So they're just in the other room getting inked or something. Um, and these, because I think how Polly explained um, how Jason's just filling this in a little bit. So we only have blocks in the room that would fit in those little spaces. That's all. I think that was also, this is a picture of him. We might've had some reprints of the little guys. Exactly. So he has to um, steady hand has, they were re-inked. Those probably the ones on the table were being, uh, were re-inked and have to, and replaced. Now, the one shot deal too is we can only make one mono print at a time. Well, that's mono print is one, but we don't reprint usually. It's, if that makes sense. So, you take them off, they have to be cleaned. It's a huge part of it. So you get one print, then you take them off. And if you want to make another print, you have to clean all those blocks too. <laughs> so a part that I sort of exit out of, but that's kind of, um, but honestly, and, and I think um, JP articulated all of this that, for me and the installation part is I have to make the arrangement. I'm doing the still life. I'm not, I don't want to give that process up because it's, it's about learning and it's okay. I'll go in there and we'll, we'll lay the colors out. We'll ink the blocks and then I'll make the picture. And so that's the joy. That's a, I, and so uh, the one on the table is a certain um, color arrangement. That's a kind of classic for me. If you look at the um, nine colors, variations on that, but the color wheel. The other ones um, on, the, on the wall were probably done a different time and in a whole different color um, arrangement. So I can look at those and um, you can look at those and you know it's a different time that we made those too. So the color ideas are different every time we make the prints. 
Well, we should keep going. We have a lot more to get to, if that's okay. Oh, so what are we looking at here? Well, um, I think this is jumping forward a little bit, maybe 2012, but basically- 2009. It's, uh, oh, 2009, <laughs> so not so far ahead, but it's basically a, a kind of our first color chart of polys. Um, not not based on this book that another color is um, George Field, right? George, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, that's his color wheel in the center, and he had all these different theories about, you know, that secondary colors were actually primary colors, and he had a whole thing with music and sound and color and relationship, um, and so this is just sort of this portfolio. We had made a bunch of monoprints, and some sort of color theme started. And then we just sort of tailored that to become an actual edition of prints um, because it seems such a fitting thing to make a color chart with these flowers. Um, that sort of represented the, the color chart um, loosely, but then with complementary and extra little bits in, in each print. Right. It's, funny. It's, it's called Color Field Notes. And I like that it was an homage to the prints that we started, but it also was kind of a way of wrapping up the flowers. It's not like the flowers are ever going to go away, but I think it was a really, let's do a yellow print with flowers. Let's do a green, let's do. And um, so I think it was a, a kind of bring back us the structure of the early color exercises. Okay, I'm gonna keep going because um, we, just have maybe five, 10 more minutes before we want to uh, go to some questions. So this looks well, like fabric again. Yes, and, and just kind of to show where I was, what was going on in the studio, I was drawing on the velvet and I was drawing with lines and that kind of led to the next slide, which is the wood streets. So what's interesting me, <laughs> to me about the wood streets is that you see grain. It's the only um, print that we I, did yeah. with the wood grain. And I like that idea that, you know, we were working with wood, wood prints, wood block prints, but they're not what people think of as, as wood blocks. Right, exactly. So, mm -hmm. and you can go to the next. Um, these are Byzantine, this is, okay. So this is, um, Byzantine Baroque and 2014. So we're a little bit out of sequence, but what was a process that kind of went back to when we were early explaining um, the spraying, but I was really interested in, there's this technique called a rainbow roll. And I know that a lot of people think it's a cliche and people hate the rainbow roll, but as somebody who loves color, loves rainbows, I, um, and I know at the time, you did not want to do rainbow rolls. That's not completely <laughs> true. But. <laughs> but I was like, bring it on, we're gonna rainbow roll. So we rainbow rolled, right? Yeah, it is uh, an extensive rainbow role exercise that's for sure and also the the joint like you would see in the earlier rainbow parks which which were not rainbow rolls but but the sticks uh the slide that you showed of polys um was when the color started touching because with the flowers they never really touched at least not significantly and here you had the joining of that kind of comparison of color and, uh, and with these taken to just a whole other level you know yeah. Right. So the, are these, these are not edition prints or are they? It's more just a, uh, your- No, mono print. You're, you're, okay. Oh, they're, that's a mono print, I see. But you're, okay. And also the skill of the rollers, you have to see, look at that. I mean, it, it's so beautiful. What we would do is you'd lay down to a color and a color and a color. And sometimes we'd lay down white color, white, white, our black color, black and then they would roll and it could be, um, we did some large prints too, that the rollers, um, it could be six feet. Yeah, well, they were park size. So they were park size. Yeah, 80 inches long. Also here we're using the etching press. So we kind of switched over at a certain point um, from the hydraulic press to the um, etching press. 
but they're mono, so they'd be almost like monotypes. Yeah, these are mono prints too. Right. I'm going to keep going if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Well, here's some. That was, a that was a little earlier. Those are the. Um, those are called rain. That's Rainbow Street. Yeah, I exactly. think. And street and it, it is a, a size. Right, and you can see here the sticks are a half, they're half inch wide. I think about four feet high, and uh, obviously playing a lot with the whole color and color charts and color theory. But you can sort of see a little bit of the rainbow roll developing, but they're they're actually not rainbow rolled. There's just so many sticks with so many colors. Sorry, when you say sticks, does that mean wood sticks? It's a wood. Yeah, block? sorry, like wood wooden. Uh, so, right. So you didn't ink it with the rainbow roll. You inked each one separately and then kind of jigged it all together. Jigged it all together like a jigsaw, mm -hmm. an easy jigsaw, but but complex with all those colors and and the scale. What's the scale? Uh, I think overall. this is four feet um, high and ninety eight inches long, which is a little over. Uh, so it's like a mural size yeah. print. Okay. Maybe anyway. you can talk about this one. <laughs> this is an interesting. This is Nirvana. Mm -hmm. So with the the previous print, you see the the half inch stick language sort of coming in, and um, there's there's prints between that one and these that where we would ink up multiple sticks of each color. So we would say three of yellow, three of whatever color she probably wanted to do three of each. And then she was starting to put them together in some sort of rhythm or some sort of order. And this exercise was sort of done in this, where, where we inked up, I believe two sticks and we made a color chart of 30 colors. So we basically took the six primary and secondary colors and made a variation of five of each starting from cool to warm on each one. Um, you often see this in color wheels where they make a more complex color wheels, which goes to 18 colors or some divisible amount. So we chose five of each and then they were put together in a sequence that kind of revolved and to get all the way around that process. It made these six prints, but they're all with the same sticks and the exact same colors just in this revolving arrangement. Um, again, doing something with a color chart that I don't really think has been done. So they really represent this, as Polly was saying with the color field notes, the structure, the structure that we also had developed. So we had this completely loose flower thing going on and loose color and rainbow rolls and all of this other stuff. And then this shows this kind of studied rigidity and really analyzing what happens when you put something together. And it was also kind of like magic. So we, we um, put the, we lined this, the, um, the sticks up one way, then we did the exact opposite. And so like you'll see the first two prints are all the same color, different arrangement. Oh, they're all, all the prints are all exactly the, same the same colors. Yeah. So it was so sort of for us, it was this wonderful thing that was happening. And I remember these prints, we just sort of sat on them for a long yeah. time. And then one day, a couple of years later, um, JP brought them up stairs and probably on this wall. Yeah. And we walked in and we were like, oh, wow, we should addition these. It's such an interesting idea. And um, I, think, I think I knew when we did them, I was really interested in this. But sometimes you have to sit on things and, and this was the case. Yeah. Um, and so for me, sometimes I'm not interested in additioning something, but this was something that seemed perfect to addition. I was there on the initial, I was there, and then I could kind of give it up to um, the addition. Great. I'm going to keep going. Okay, and this looks like a different series. Can you tell well, us? This is, this is? It's dear to my heart because um, the street outside is Dogwood Lane and also the Pennsylvania. I grew up in Pennsylvania, I'm from Pennsylvania, and um, near Bucks County and the dogwood tree is a very beautiful tree and one day the dogwood tree a branch of the dogwood tree fell on the property of Durham Press and we both had the idea to cut it up and make um, blocks from that. Great. 
Um, I had, there was a question, um, how do you ink the blocks or the sticks? Do you use a, a, a big brayer or um, do you, oh, and do you mix um, commercial block printing inks to get desired colors? How do you get those colors? Yeah. So how we, do you ink and how do you get the colors? Um, well, inking is, is very straightforward. It's with, with smaller, generally smaller brayers because when we have, we have sometimes 60, 70, maybe even as many as 100 colors out at once. And mostly the blocks in scale are relatively small. The larger flowers we use larger brayers for. But in general, we're sort of working with lots of blocks of an intricate form. So the brayers can be four or six inch brayers. Um, and the ink, we use all of the inks, Charbonnel, um, I'm blanking because they've all changed their names so many times, but there's like three major graphic chemical and Hanchi um, inks. Um, they all have overlapping colors, but all companies have a few unique colors. And so the only way to achieve kind of this range that Polly wanted was to use every ink from every company and, and combine them, which can be problematic because they're all different consistencies. Sometimes they don't like to go together, but we pretty much just used what we could get our hands on when it when it was the right color. But do you mix? Uh, do you mix a color, or it's always oh, all just of it's hand mixed by by the people in the studio? Oh wow, wow! All right, I'm going to keep going because we do. Oh, so now these are some examples of the. Yeah, on the left books. you have that that park size again, an mm. incredible amount of blocks and. Mm. Wow. We did one of these. It's all tiny, tiny prints. Yeah. It's pretty tiny blocks. It's really amazing. These colors too is interesting. We, we started out small and doing a wall of um, maybe 30 color arrangements, mm -hmm. different color palettes, um, same color palette, but, a, but it, it was, we experimented a lot with um, the color on this, on the dogwoods. Yeah. Gorgeous color. Um, so we are at watching the time. It's twelve fifty three, I think. So um, I know we have quite a few more slides to get to. So I think maybe what what we should do is kind of go through the slides quickly and but maybe stop on one more project. Um, I think we have the mosaic series, the atomic series, and then your most recent prints, Heart and Soul. So what do you think? Well, I can introduce the, I just say a little bit about the um, mosaic series and you can then go through them. Um, that's, and that's, that's sort of a wrap up. So in 2012, I was incredibly lucky. Um, I was a Rome prize winner at, and I went to the Ro Rome for a year, the American Academy. When I came back, I hadn't printed for a year. And so um, these prints happened. We had um, the, the zigzag prints and they were empty. <laughs> so we had a few. So I came back and I had looked at Ravenna, the mosaics in Ravenna, the Cosmati floors. A year in Rome, we came back and we made this series um, called Empress and Emperor. And so, maybe you can go quickly, but what was interesting for me is here, um, and people can see too, the kind of um, complexity of the blocks. So from the simple flowers, now we were making absolutely, um, some of those blocks are 16 parts and they take one person to take the part apart and, and put it together. So you can go quickly through these, but I just wanted people to kind of, um, <laughs> it was, it became very Baroque. <laughs> after a year in, uh, after a year in um, Rome, this is what happened. Yeah, I mean, I think you just see that it's taking the relationship just to the next step, you know? Yeah, it's just incredible. And I, yeah, you could I see mean, in that one slide how many people were working on it simultaneously, too. These are the atomics, and you can go quickly. Um, what happened is we just started shuff, shuff, sh shuffling the blocks around. And I think these are sort of the craziest prints we've ever made. <laughs> They're so intense. 
and and just this was the kind of the pinwheels what i love about the atomics and pinwheel is like how many different geometric forms can a pinwheel take and we just i don't even know if somebody wanted to count how many blocks are in there we just used everything that was in the and started making more so incredible okay so here we are this was uh, a print series you did just recently in 2020 correct these are the last prints and um, that we made and it's um, there are many hearts and at this point I was looking at um, a lot of um, Pennsylvania German fractors and um, there are a lot of hearts in those, but also thinking about now and the time, and um, this was in 2002, and, and like the flowers, hearts are all, all also kind of problematic sometimes. Um, so we, and I was very interested in, in just um, different kinds of colors more the Pennsylvania Dutch after looking at the Pennsylvania German art and fractors. And so we went to town and we made, first we made as many different color arrangements as possible. These are not individual blocks. It's a, a five- um, Yeah, it's like a fly block, block registering thing. Something we'd never really done before. It's sort of almost a traditional kind of printing setup. And so, um, it was also based on, I was um, working on a wallpaper for the project that I'm doing now that's coming up at Arcadia. So it came out of what was working. I was working in the studio, but a wallpaper, a much more kind of patterned um, uh, piece. And so, and, and kind of off color. I really loved kind of, you know, only five colors. Yeah, that's, which stunning. Was and it, so it's a portfolio of nine prints. On the right uh, and the left yeah. of the Armana prints. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and I love, Polly, that you did these in 2020. So it was in the middle of the pandemic and you're doing hearts. Um, you know, as they said to you before, to me, it just feels like, um, this very beautiful uh, Valentine and, and message of love. Well, and I love me. that you're just, you're, you, you know, you said the hearts are problematic, flowers are problematic, but you uh, go there. Um, and that's really a beautiful thing. So well, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. It, you know, during the the pandemic, I, I sent Valentine's to friends and, and I think we all needed our spirits lifting and to connect. So the hearts for me were a way to say thank you to my friends. Well, thank you both so much. This was um, just incredible. And we're at one o'clock, but I'm going to, um, see if if you all don't mind a couple minutes just to take um a couple of questions because we do have uh several um in the q a let's see um oh here's a question have you ever um looked at Cre polly have you ever looked at created creating artist books as much of your vision naturally lends itself to narrative arrangement well, I have a sideline that I do. I make more um, scrapbooks. So every project, because I generate a lot of um, images and love kind of doing research on everything that I do. So I have over the years, but I make them for myself. I'm usually make like five. I just did one for, um, because um, I've been working on the Arcadia project for about five years. So um, I haven't made the kind of straight kind of artist book, but um, I, I'm not against that, but I, I love the kind of scrapbook. So I've been making scrapbooks. Oh, well, that would be great to see. Um, can you tell us briefly about the Arcadia project? You've mentioned it a couple of times. Yeah, so 
It, it's called For the Love of Una Hale, and it's a three-part project. It's, um, one part is ceramics, and I've been researching um, the artist David Ellinger, who I grew up with. He was, um, he died in 19, um, 1980, I think, but he was, I wouldn't say a folk art artist, but he was, and not even untrained, but he was a painter who painted the Pennsylvania German people. He lived amongst them and I grew up with these. Um, and it's a way of going home and sort of researching where I came from. So um, we were very lucky, I got two grants, a creative capital grant and a Pew charitable fund grant to make an exhibition and a catalog and to also have a residency in the ceramic department at Arcadia University and work with their head ceramicist, Greg Moore. So the hearts, because of their Pennsylvania German origin and a lot of um, imagery that's from David Ellinger's paintings. So it's been a wonderful journey and it, it's um, a little bit like going home again. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to talk to both of you all day, but we are, uh, we are gonna honor the time and um, I think um, wrap it up now. Um, I'm, get, I'm going, do, does either of you have anything else you wanna say? No, it's been a really lovely experience and thank you so much for, for doing it. Yes, thank you. And I wanna say that, well, I'm sure you can tell how important Durham Press has been and I couldn't have made that. JP has made me a printmaker. I wasn't a printmaker. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that came through. That absolutely came through. So thank you both so much. Um, I just want to remind everybody to tune in next Friday, October uh, 29th, as Judy said, for part two of Breaking, Breaking Ground Pattern and Print with artist, artist Joyce Kosloff, uh, great printer, Judith Solodkin, uh, moderated by Judy Hecker. And now, Jenny, do you want to uh, say the final one? That was such a happy way to end the week. Um, and that was really just joy. Um, thank you, Polly and John Paul, for sharing your process with us. Thank you, Ann, Star, and Judy for putting this program together. Um, I hope that you all can join us on Monday for the Metropolitan Museum of Art Symposium, The Art of Today, Grosvenor School Lino Cuts and Their Legacy which is being held in conjunction with the exhibition, Modern Times, British Prints, 1913 to 1939 at the Met. On Monday, we'll have a conversation with Mary Ryan, Gordon Samuel and collector Les Garfield, moderated and organized by Met curator of prints and drawings, Jennifer Farrell. So I hope everyone has a great weekend and we will see you on Monday. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Take care.